Hey there, art nerds. Welcome to my series on volumetric drawing. Volumetric drawing is a way of thinking about breaking down and understanding the world that we see into easy to replicate 3D volumetric shapes. And this is the key to how I learned how to draw and how a lot of artists go about systematically thinking about drawing. So if you've always struggled to draw and you're a little bit more mathematically minded, you guys might find this to be a helpful mini series. So I've talked about volumetric drawing here on the channel in the past, and I'm going to be sure to link those tutorials down in the description for you guys. But I wanted to kind of take a holistic start to finish approach. So 3D volumetric drawing can be used to draw very simple things as well as more complicated shapes. And it's a great way to visually break down the world around you into a series of very simple to draw 3D volumetric shapes. So once you learn how to draw these basic 3D shapes, you're going to be in great shape and you'll be ready to progress on to more complicated images and illustrations. So as I already mentioned, I've done a few 3D volumetric drawing tutorials here on the channel, but in this series, I wanted to take a holistic approach and walk you guys through every step of the process from learning how to draw these fairly easy to replicate 3D volumetric shapes, the sort that are commonly taught in ninth grade geometry class, and how to turn them into slightly more complicated images as well as how to use that to understand not only the human figure, but animal anatomy, cars, buildings, way more complicated things. Basically, everything in the world can be broken down into a series of pretty simple volumetric shapes. I have most of them here. I am missing a couple though. We've got cylinders, so think about cans of soda or soup cans. So cylinders have a circle for the top and the bottom. If viewed directly head on, they look rectangular, but then when viewed from any other angle besides straight on, you can actually see that it's a rounded form. We've also got cones. So pretty similar to cylinders where we have a circle at the bottom, but it actually comes to a point at the center of the circle. We have spheres, so looks like a circle straight on, but it is volumetric like a ball. We have triangular prisms. They look like a triangle from straight on, a rectangle from a side view, but any other view, much like with our cylinder, we can actually see the dimensionality of the shape. We have cubes, which look like a square from any angle straight or any face straight on. But as soon as we look at it from an angle, it starts to kind of reveal what form it is. We have rectangular prisms, which are very similar to triangular prisms, except that they have four sides rather than three sides. And what I don't have here are pyramids and wedges. So pyramids would be like a D4 or like the pyramids in Egypt. They can have a multitude of different faces, so they don't all have to be triangular at the base. They can be square, they can be hexagonal, but they do all come to a point. And I, I dearly wish I actually had an example of that here, but you can definitely Google that and find that. We're also missing wedges, which are pretty similar to uh, triangular prisms. We're also missing, I wanna say a D20, and my brain is totally blanking on that. But we do have a variety of more complicated 3D volumetric shapes that often it might be a little bit easier if you're actually working from a digital program uh, to generate that for you. For those sort of more complicated shapes, I generally start with a sphere and then I start kind of creating more angles from that. So today, I wanted to show you guys how to draw these basic 3D volumetric shapes. And I'm gonna do a series of these, using these as reference for practice, showing how drawing them from different angles and different views can really change what we're looking at. I'm also going to show you guys how to break down everyday household objects that you guys probably have around the house into these very basic 
easier to draw forms. And then finally, we're gonna set up a still life and I'm gonna show you guys how to break down that still life made up of everyday household objects into one of, uh, break them down into these 3D volumetric forms. So this is something that it does take some practice to get used to it. If you already have a method of drawing, this may seem alien and it may seem more difficult, but this is a great way to kind of think about and break down objects that you might have a lot of difficulty understanding. And this is really great when you start introducing perspective, atmospheric, one point, two point, and three point perspective, understanding that everything in the world can be broken down basically into either these shapes or more amorphous flower sack, jelly bean-esque shapes, a uh, little bit little bit more uh, squishy kind of shapes. Once you understand that everything in the world can be broken down into these shapes or the more amorphous shapes, you'll be able to draw anything you see as well as anything you can imagine. So understanding how to draw and think volumetrically, how to analyze the world and break it down into some basic shapes will really open up your art and make it a lot easier for you to utilize uh, different types of perspective as well as foreshortening. So to start off, I'm gonna show you guys how to draw these basic shapes. Shapes. And then I'm going to challenge you guys to do a little bit of homework, do a little bit of exercise where you practice drawing these shapes from different views and different angles. And while this might seem really simplistic, the better you get at drawing these shapes believably from different views, the better you're going to be at drawing basically anything you can imagine or might want to draw. So this is one of those art practice exercises that really pays off in a big Big way later on. So I'm going to start with the sphere. This seems like it might be one of the easiest things, but it's deceptively difficult. And one of the reasons it's difficult is a lot of people have trouble drawing circles. And one of the reasons people have a lot of trouble drawing circles is they want to do it really slowly and methodically. Whereas the key to drawing a circle is to use your wrist rather than to use your fingers. Ideally, if you're drawing a really big circle, you wanna use most of your arm for this and to draw it fairly quickly and to overextend if necessary because you can always clean it up after you have that base circle drawn. So this is another thing where it really pays off to practice drawing circles, trying to get them, I wouldn't say perfect because I find that perfection tends to kill a lot of the liveliness in art, but as you know, pretty close to dang good as possible. And circles and spheres are really useful because they make up so many objects. The very base shape for a head starts with a sphere. So understanding how to draw spheres well and how to draw circles well really pays off later on down the road. So there are a few ways to kind of break down understanding how to draw a sphere. Now a sphere tends to look the same no, water, no matter what angle you view it from, no matter how far away or how close, the only thing that really changes with a sphere would be the size of it because it still remains in its base form, a circle but uh, we can kind of give a few indications to show that we haven't just drawn a flat circle like a penny or a coin or a, a piece of paper cut into a circle, but we've actually drawn a sphere. Now, one of the ways to do that is probably pretty obvious to you guys, and that is to use some shading to have a light source and a shadow source. So this having our light, our shadow, and then our bounce, our reflective light, could be a way to demonstrate that something isn't just a circle, but it's a dimensional sphere. Another way to do that is to draw the hemispherical crosshairs. So going from top to bottom, so vertically, and then from left to right, so horizontally. And this will also give some dimensionality. And this is really important for example, when you wanna draw a face and we're starting with a circle or a sphere because these crosshairs will actually show what direction the character might be looking in. So that could be a really helpful thing to start practicing and to start thinking about now. And this is particularly helpful if you do say comic thumbnails, right? 
and you want to indicate in your thumbnails, which are super tiny, which direction your character is looking, using a crosshair to do that can be really handy. So practicing drawing a circle, pretty minimal. The big difference that you're going to have with this is probably the material that your sphere and your circle are made. Well, I say I'm going to use them interchangeably mostly because right now we're taking this 3D volumetric form and turning it into a 2D drawing. So it would look like a circle, but uh, it's going to be whatever our sphere is made of. So this is made out of like a foam material. It has kind of a suede surface. So we're not getting a lot of strong highlights or a lot of strong shadows. The color on this is pretty uniform and my studio is lit like the sun. So, and that's to kind of help eliminate, you know, harsh cast shadows on my paper that make it difficult to see what I'm drawing. Unfortunately, it does not work so well for lighting a sphere. But frankly, if you want to practice doing this at home, I would collect a few balls made out of different things, like maybe metal ball bearings or rubber bouncy balls or some marbles and practice drawing those and capturing maybe the surface details. So practicing drawing like an orange might be a good way to kind of capture what makes a sphere look rounded and volumetric. Um, and drawing glass where you have the highlight or if you're drawing like a marble where it has an inclusion or something on the interior of it and how the gloss of the marble might affect how we view that. So practicing drawing different spherical objects can be really useful. So this one is a pretty easy one to practice. The real thing you want to focus on is getting decent at drawing circles. And like I said, I tend to overlap them like this. And I'm using most of my wrist to do this. So I'm actually using my elbow all the way down to the arm. So I'm moving my arm a lot. So it's good to have lots of space to practice drawing in. And this is going to add to the longevity of your artistic life because rather than wearing out the tendons and the muscles in your hands, you're utilizing your whole arm and your whole arm is really better prepared to take that kind of strain than those teeny little tendons in your fingers. So what I would recommend you guys do if you're not good at drawing circles is to just practice some of the techniques that I've gone over with you guys today. Maybe fill an entire page with circles until you're able to draw them quickly and confidently instead of kind of drawing them really slowly like this where we're using little tiny pencil marks to do that one at a time. That's a lot of wear and tear on your hand and it takes a lot of time. So I would recommend taking the looser faster approach and just practicing that and becoming more confident in drawing circles that way. So once you become pretty confident in drawing spheres and circles, we can move on to cylinders and cones. So cylinders are pretty similar to soup cans, cola cans, water bottles. You probably see a lot of cylinders. You can have really, really narrow cylinders that are kind of like a coin shape. So like tires or coins, you can have much larger, longer cylinders like pipes, but it's basically from front view, it looks like a rectangle. And then from side view, it looks like a circle. And then any other view, we start having a combination of the two. So what I think is pretty helpful, especially if you have reference, so you could use a can for this is to practice drawing cylinders. And one of the things I advise that you guys do, even though we can't see through this shape, we know there's a circle on both ends, is to start practicing drawing your 3D volumetric shape through. So not just drawing what we immediately see, but drawing what we know is on the other side of this. You can also practice shading, and that'll kind of help you take these 2D drawings into something that's a little bit more volumetric feeling, a little bit more three-dimensional in, in how it feels and how it looks. And varying the angle that you're you, seeing your reference. So if you're practicing along at home, what I would recommend you do, same with the circle, is using our little reference cylinder, fill an entire page with cylinders from different views.
So these sort of shapes that are more rectangular, longer in one dimension than they are in another, these are a really great opportunity to explore and play with foreshortening. So foreshortening is where objects that are uh, like this sort of rectangular, the side that is closer to you, the side that's coming to the viewer is much larger or larger than the side that's away or moving away from the viewer. And you can really exaggerate this for some fun dynamic techniques. So while you're just kind of getting used to these 3D volumetric shapes, sometimes it can be much more helpful to sort of think about a real world object that you're familiar with that reminds you or, or that is this shape. So this plus this would make an ice cream cone. So fortunately cone is in the name that makes it a little bit easier, but say this one here, this might be a can. This one here might be a dice or a die. This one could be a building. And then this one is a little bit strange because it's a triangular prism. And we don't have too, too many of these in real life other than maybe say an A-frame house. And then of course, with our pyramidal shape, our three-sided and our four-sided pyramids, we can think about the pyramids in Egypt or the Aztec pyramids. Just finding real world things that you're already kind of familiar with will help you think about these shapes and remember them, hopefully, mentally. So with the cone, the cone's kind of interesting because from this view, it forms a triangle. And then from this view, it forms a circle. And you can have really, really short cones that come to a point really early on. You can have really long cones. It could be a trumpet. It could be a bullhorn. There's all sorts of things that cones can be. But frankly, when it comes to what we're looking at in the real world, often we see cones or truncated cones where maybe they cut the tip off. So we just have the bottom and then it comes to like right there. Truncated cones are a part of lots of everyday objects. So even if something might not look like it immediately has a cone in it, if you look closely and you kind of notice the different individual volumetric shapes that make up that object, you'll start to notice things like cones that have just been varied a little bit. And another thing about volumetric drawing is you can also feel free to kind of warp in the sides or warp out the sides. We're just using this to kind of create a base shape that you can modify and add details to later. So we have our triangle, we have our circle, and then what makes a cone a cone when we're doing things on paper, so two dimensionally, is you know what angle we're looking at it and how it kind of reveals itself to us. And we can also use a little bit of shading on these sort of rounded volumetric shapes to kind of imply that it's light moving along a curved surface. You can also use sort of circumference lines to give the viewer an idea of what kind of shape they're looking at. So much like with the cylinder, it's really beneficial to be able to just practice drawing this shape. So what I'm gonna do is the same thing I recommend that you guys do. I'm going to fill this sheet of paper with sketches of this cone viewed at different angles. So let's say you're viewing the cone this way where the point of the cone is coming to the viewer. This can be kind of tricky to do, especially if it's straight on. It's sort of like drawing animal muzzles where if you're not careful, you can't really tell what animal the person is drawing. Like for example, a wolf looks a lot like a bear in, in just a two dimensional illustration when viewed from straight on. So something you can kind of do is you can add the point there and then add the shading to help give it some dimensionality. But generally we would avoid drawing the cone from this view because it really obscures what we're actually looking at. And we would just start to turn it in space a little bit so that we start to get that point and we can actually tell that a cone is a cone. One more thing. Now, not every conical object has the point coming from the direct middle of the circle, but most of them do. So it's a pretty good rule of thumb if you are sketching out a cone, you can go ahead and subdivide 
the circle and then depending on what angle you're drawing you can find the center point by drawing a crosshair and then extend it from there. So if you want to practice these exercises at home, I would really recommend that you work with a real world 3D object as your reference because that way you can kind of manipulate it in your hand and you can see what it looks like from different angles. You can buy this particular set of manipulatives. I'll have that down in the description for you guys. You can also go to Michael's in the floral section. They sell styrofoam shapes. Sometimes you can find those at Dollar Tree as well. Or you can try to find household objects like cans and balls and dice that kind of fit this niche and represent these objects. But regardless of what you do, I really recommend rather than working from say the reference I'm providing in the video, which you can do that if you want to, but I know my hands are kind of obscuring these and I'm not really trying to show them off in a way that would be most beneficial for you guys. I apologize for that. I will include a segment where I do. Um, you couldn't, I would also recommend not working from photos because it's really difficult to see the actual volume of these shapes. So what I would recommend you do is you go out and you find real examples of these 3D volumetric shapes and work from those and handle those and manipulate those and examine those because often drawing from real life is a much richer and more rewarding experience than just working along with a video. So I'm gonna have a list of suggestions down in the description below for real world objects that'll fit most of these. I'm really kind of struggling with the triangular <laughs> prism. I'm like, oh, what, what, in, what in real life? do we regularly deal with that looks like this? I'm sure there's something and I'm sure one of you guys will let me know down in the comments below. In fact, that other than a prism that we could look through, what in real life is this particular shape? Let me know. So talking about triangular prisms, this is a five-sided shape, I believe. We've got three sides here and then one on each side. Two of the sides look like triangles two of the sides look, or I'm sorry, three of the sides look like rectangles. And then when we combine them and we look at it in perspective from any view other than straight on or straight on, we actually get to see how complicated the shape starts to be. And don't worry if you struggle with drawing these kinds of shapes. Again, that's why we're filling entire sheets of paper, practicing, and the more you practice, the easier it's gonna get. It's taken years for me to kind of see the world this way, but it really made the difference for me and it really marked a turning point for me with my art and my ability to draw characters and environments and create worlds. So I think it's something that's really important to teach people. And I feel like this is a key for a lot of people in actually learning how to draw. In fact, I'm actually working on this tutorial because I'm teaching a three class series with the St. Charles Parish library system. So I'm using this as a way to kind of help me prepare for my class. So I am really glad that I can share it with them and I'm really glad that I can share it with you guys. So if we were starting out, I'm gonna have kind of a basic view of the shape. And I'm gonna make it a little bit smaller as it recedes in the background. I'm also going to draw the shape through. So I'm gonna draw the sides we don't see. And I'm gonna use the blue for the signs we do see. I think that'll make it a little bit easier for you guys to see. In fact, if you're kind of struggling with this, something that has made it easier for me when I was first getting started with this is to use multiple colored LEDs to help me understand the individual shapes. Whether you're using one color for the outline and one color to mark the visible planes, or you're using one color to demonstrate the sides that we can see and another color to draw in the sides we can't see. Whatever makes it easier for your brain to understand what we're drawing, 
that's totally valid and you should definitely go with that. So what I'm gonna do is I am going to practice filling this sheet with our triangular prism, drawing it from a variety of different angles. And of course, I challenge you guys to draw along. Something else, when you guys are doing these exercises along with me, I really want you guys to not worry about erasing. If you make a mistake, like this one, I drew the sides too long, don't even erase it. Just draw another one where you've kind of corrected the mistake, so redraw it. Because erasing it is, in this instance, when we're just doing sketches to understand and we're just doing sketches to study and we're just trying to learn how to draw something, I find that erasing and going for perfection for an individual illustration, that's a waste of time. That's worthless. It's really better for me to get the mileage in and to draw it over and over and over again until I really understand what I'm looking at and I feel much more confident in the shapes. So we're not aiming for perfection. This is in your sketchbook. No one has to see this. We're just aiming for practice. We're aiming for getting those skills down. We're aiming to build confidence and we're aiming to improve understanding. So the more you practice it, the easier it's going to get and hopefully the more it's going to make sense. And there's some great books. There's some great tutorials on this topic. I did not invent volumetric drawing. I highly recommend the Glenn Vilpu drawing manual if you can get a hold of it. I also recommend Proko here on YouTube. It's a channel with a lot of really great drawing tutorials. I'm doing this demonstration here as more of kind of an introduction to a method that might be new to a lot of people. It's a method that unfortunately is not really taught in K through 12 art classes that often. And uh, I think that's really kind of a shame because volumetric drawing, I think can really make uh, how you see the world around you and how you understand how everything we see can be broken down. It, it, it makes it so much more accessible, I think. Um, so. Basically, when it comes to drawing, I'm a big fan of whatever methods seem to click for you, seem to make sense for you, go with that. So I'm just offering a different method of seeing the world in case you're having trouble understanding some things. And this method works so well if you're trying to learn how to draw in perspective. And I don't really understand why when we teach perspective, we also don't teach volumetric drawing at the same time, or at least in my experiences as a student and as a teacher, it's not commonly taught at the same time, but, or the two are not connected and a demonstration of how the world can be broken down into these sort of basic shapes isn't really presented either. But I think this is really the keys to the drawing kingdom and I'm, oh, I'm a big fan of it, of course. So uh, hopefully you guys can tell from my enthusiasm that I actually believe in this, in this method, of breaking down these sort of shapes or breaking down more complex objects into simpler shapes is how I draw basically everything. I mean, I'll start with a really loose thumbnail, but once I wanna start getting details in and I wanna make it feel more somewhat real because I am a cartoony comic artist, um, volumetric drawing really allows me to kind of figure that out. And a great, practice that we're going to get into a little bit later on, but it's one I'd like to see, I'd like to work on more and I'd like to see you guys introduce if possible, is to practice just drawing everyday objects when you've got some time to kill in 3D volumetric. And um, maybe even draw the object first, just like looking at it and then try to figure out how to break it down. And we'll do some exercises like that as well. So you guys can see as I'm changing and rotating the shape, and I'm not really rotating it a whole lot since I'm, I'm talking to you and I'm sketching. Uh, I'm just rotating it a little, but you can really see how we perceive the shape, how we perceive this volumetric shape changes as we change the angle that we're holding it and we change the viewpoint. In fact, I goofed because really from my viewpoint, you should be able to see a little bit of both sides. And sometimes I have to close one of my eyes so that I can like kind of flatten it out and really see those individual shapes.
So today I'm going to lump cubes and rectangular prisms into the same category. They're both rhomboids. Cubes and rectangular prisms are really pretty similar. The only real difference is that rectangular prisms are slightly longer in one dimension. They have rectangular faces on one side and then square faces on the other. These are both six sided shapes. So if you guys have dice around the house or cereal boxes, then you're probably familiar with both of them. And either of those could be a useful reference in this instance. So this is one of the ones that I've, I've noticed my much younger students, when we talk about volumetric drawing, this is the first one they know how to draw. And I think it's because it's just kind of a fun trick to show younger artists how to draw like a box because it, it really starts to feel more dimensional and kind of pop out. So you've probably seen people do the wire grid see-through cubes before. This is something a lot of people are at least familiar with, even if they don't know how to draw it. And there's a few different ways to think about these shapes. So with the cube, we are starting with something that always has a square face. No matter what side we turn it to, there's always a square there. And then as we start to rotate it in space, then we start to see more and more faces. And this is one where I think it would be useful, again, for you guys to try and think about it volumetrically and try to think about what the back and the two hidden sides look like, even if you're not drawing them. And if you start to confuse yourself, because the thing about cubes is they can start to kind of pop out at you. So we have them, this one going this way and that way and that way at first, but depending on what you exaggerate, you can make a cube pop out in the opposite direction. So it's really important to kind of pay attention to which side you're drawing. And if it starts to pop out at you, introduce another color just to kind of help, uh, help your eyes and your brain focus on which way you're drawing the cube. Now, cubes and rectangular prisms are also really important to think about because when you're drawing in perspective, when you're drawing in two point, one point, three point perspective, if you're drawing interior environments like rooms, most rooms are rectangular or square in floor plan. Most rooms have 90 degree corners. So being able to draw these and think about these shapes are going to be really helpful if you're ever drawing interior environments or if you're drawing the exterior of buildings. So practicing cubes and rectangular prisms is a big one to being able to draw comics and draw the sort of things that you can imagine. So as before, I am going to fill this sheet with cubes and then I'm going to fill another sheet with rectangular prisms so I can really practice my understanding of the shapes. And even if I am, if I make a mistake, like if I draw it too shallow, so I'm really trying to capture the dimension and how this shape is moving in space, which way is it going? So I did have to redraw it because I drew it kind of shallow. So what I would really encourage you guys to do is keep drawing and drawing and really try to capture what you see. And that can be really difficult when you're just starting out and it can be really easy to get discouraged. And <laughs> I mean, I've been there. Um, the best advice I have, frankly, is to stick to it and keep practicing and don't be afraid of filling up that sketchbook. That's why I buy cheap sketchbooks. I buy the 300 series Strathmore and I buy the Blick Studio sketchbooks because I'm gonna fill up my sketchbooks with sketches. I'm going to fill them up with scribbles and doodles and every not every page is gonna look good and not every page is gonna be something I wanna share on TikTok and you're probably not gonna see me do too many sketchbook flips on TikTok because frankly, a lot of my sketchbook is are these kind of studies that you know, other artists will look at it and they'll be like, yeah, I get where you're coming from. You're trying to understand how you see the world. You're trying to improve your eye. You're training your eye. You're training your hand. But a casual viewer is going to look at this and it's not going to necessarily mean anything to them. So I challenge you guys to fill up your sketchbooks with just these kinds of drawings. 
and to train yourself, train your hands, train your eyes, train your brain to see the world volumetrically and to not be afraid or ashamed of drawing things and they don't turn out the way you want them to or you're really kind of struggling with them and just redraw it and redraw it and redraw it. And one of the reasons I like drawing traditionally rather than digitally is traditionally really invites you to keep these mistakes. You have a record of what you've done poorly because to me, being able to look at what I've done poorly and to analyze it and to really think about like, not take it personally, but think about why I made those mistakes. Was I not drawing it deep enough? Was I not foreshortening it enough? Think about those mistakes and then think about what I could do in the future to correct that. And with digital drawing, it's so easy to just endlessly hit erase or endlessly just trash the canvas and start a new one. Now, you don't have to do that. I'm not saying that's the only way to draw and that um, or to practice drawing and that digitally is inherently bad. I don't feel that way at all. I'm just saying for me, drawing traditionally invites me. See, I didn't draw the rhomboid at the top uh, narrow enough. So that's me analyzing, noticing a mistake, working to rectify it, which I wouldn't have been able to do if I just immediately deleted it. But I do think keeping a record of the drawings you made that didn't work out, that weren't quite right, that's important even if it's embarrassing or you feel like it quote unquote junks up your sketchbook. Your sketchbook is a place for junking up. Your sketchbook is a place for sketching. And that's why, I mean, frankly, personally, I am I think it's a little weird. It's not really to my working method. When someone has a sketchbook and there's never any studies and there's never any mistakes and it's always perfect, fully colored drawings. I mean, you do you, but to me, the record of mistakes and the record of learning are really important. And if we wanna talk about like masterful artists, even Da Vinci kept sketches and kept notes and I, I don't know offhand if he kept what he felt like his mistakes because it seems like what we see of Da Vinci, it's all basically perfect. But, you know, I do think it's important to have those things. And I love looking at other artists' sketchbooks, especially when they've got like studies that they would consider gnarly or not worth showing or not worth keeping. I love seeing that because I feel like that's where I can really learn the most as a fellow artist is from looking at their sketchbook and seeing how they think. So I have filled my page with cubes. I'm gonna move on to my rectangular prisms.
So the basic takeaways with this exercise are draw through the shape. So shade your spheres, your cylinders, and your cones. Draw the hidden faces of your cubes and prisms. And draw confidently. If you make a mistake, don't worry about erasing. Just redraw it next to the shape and pay close attention to the areas you struggled with before. The more you practice, the more you do this, the better you're going to get. So I would recommend repeating this exercise frequently until it becomes second nature for you. And you can draw these shapes from the imagination at the drop of a hat. And that might take a lot of practice, but I promise the investment is well worth it. And for this particular exercise, for the skills we're building here, it's better to draw quickly and inaccurately. And you guys can see these are not perfectly straight lines. They're not perfectly measured angles. It's better to draw quickly and inaccurately than perfectly and slowly because what we're really trying to do is we're really trying to imprint these shapes into our brain so that we can mentally rotate them at will and be able to draw them whenever we need to. Of course, having them on hand to reference is also good and useful and I'm not putting that down at all. It's good to be able to do a combination of both. So now that we've drawn a bunch of basic 3D volumetric shapes, we've got the basics down. It's now time to start combining these shapes so we can start actually drawing the things we want to be able to draw. The next trick is to take the world that we see around us to take some real world objects and learn how to break them down into these basic 3D volumetric drawings. Learn how to simplify them into something that we now know how to draw. So I have a series of objects here. They seem to have nothing in common, but they really have one important thing in common for today's lesson. They're all based around the common cylinder. So we all know how to draw a cylinder, right? We just filled an entire page of cylinders. And while some of these are more obviously cylinder than others, these are all different variations with some differences in detail on our basic cylinder. So I'm going to demonstrate drawing a few of these for you guys, just so that you guys can kind of see where I'm coming from and how we can start breaking this down. So it would be pretty easy to start with a can of tomato paste, right? Like a can is already a basic cylinder. It's already pretty much what we're trying to, well, doesn't require a whole lot of work, right? To go from a cylinder to a can. This is a good one to start with. However, if we don't add any details, then it never becomes a can. It's still just a cylinder. So one of the important things in drawing the world around us is not just seeing those basic 3D volumetric shapes in everyday objects, but looking at our 3D volumetric shapes and learning how to turn them into everyday objects, noticing those details that make them actually those particular objects and not just the volumetric shapes. So for this can of tomato paste, I've noticed that the top and bottom are flared out a little bit. The interior has a lid and then there is another ring here on the interior, the top of our can of tomato paste. And then we also have a label that runs around the, fr the front of the can. And by drawing in these guidelines, it would make it easier for me to sketch in the lettering following the actual surface of the can. So by drawing in the label, even just sketching it in, even just doodling it and being really sloppy about it, we take something that was just a cylinder and we've turned it into an actual can of tomato paste. So that's a pretty easy example. The same goes for this can of salmon. This is more of a coin shape. It's a flatter cylinder. So it's adding in those details 
that actually make these objects start to feel like, start to look like the object that it is. So we've got a pull tab here on the top. And we've got a bit of the can at the bottom beneath the label. And you want to keep in mind with labels like this, they're going to follow the surface of the can. So they're going to kind of move, bend in the direction. Of course, I'd pick something with a mermaid on it when I'm trying to be cheap and draw cheaply. Anyway, so those are two more obvious examples. This pencil grip also a cylinder. This one has little cushies on it though. So if you want it to actually look like the pencil grip and not just like we've drawn a cylinder, we would start with our cylinder and then, so the pencil grip is kind of hollow. It also kind of bowls out and it has kind of a spiral pattern to it that's kind of raised in some areas. So this is where developing an attention for detail can be really handy. It also has some little flecks of glitter and it's vaguely see-through. So now it looks more like a spiral pencil grip than it looks like just a plain cylinder. Same goes for this alcohol marker. This is definitely a cylinder, one of the easier to recognize cylinders. So we're going to start with our base cylindrical shape that we've been practicing so much. And then we're going to start looking at the details and kind of breaking this shape down into smaller shapes. So the caps actually go in a bit and they also have this little lip on them. That would actually be more like a wedge shape and I do wish I had some wedges to show you guys as an example. And sometimes it's helpful to be able to switch over to our colored lead or our other colored lead because that can kind of help us add in those details instead of everything getting kind of lost. And when you're first practicing this and you're just kind of getting used to it, that can be a really important thing. When I was first getting used to using volumetric drawing for figure drawing, I had to use multi, like two different colors of lead. One to do all of kind of the base drawing where I'm drawing the arms and the legs as cylinders and the other to actually kind of refine on top of that and draw the hair and the eyes and the clothes and the facial features. So those details can really start to make something feel like the object it's supposed to represent. And then this here is a series of cylinders kind of stacked on top of each other, kind of curving into a sphere. So we start to get more complicated. We're starting to add in a few different shapes. And that's going to be most objects you see in the outside world. They're going to be a combination of several 3D volumetric shapes. Even the lid, even the top here, has a cylinder that then has a sphere on top of it. And I have some liquid in here. So also drawing from reference a lot and practicing from reference is really gonna build up your visual library. It's gonna give you more things you kind of already know how to draw and that's going to make it a lot easier. So in a lot of my tutorials, I talk about relying on Google and other image search engines for reference. And that's not just to get the basic shapes down, that's to get those details down so that the thing feels like that specific thing. So if I was drawing a rabbit, rather than just drawing a generic rabbit, I might look up a specific type of rabbit so that it looks like an Angora versus a cottontail. And you don't always need that specificity, especially if you just enjoy drawing for fun and you're not really trying to draw for any specific reason other than just pure enjoyment. You can take that detail level as far as you want to go. But if you want to tell stories, if you want to make comics or animation, the ability to add in that detail level so that things feel more real and they're more recognizable is a really great skill to have. 
and pretty similar with this bottle here. This is more obvious cylindrical shapes. The roll of tape is pretty similar to our chicken of the sea and the same goes for our squat round of watercolor paper. These are all cylinders and it's the details you add that make these cylinders feel more like those actual objects. Now as you're practicing this, you may start to encounter things you'd like to practice drawing, but they seem kind of complicated. And a great way to learn how to draw, how to break down these more complicated images is to do draw overs where you would print it out and then either using a different color pencil or using tracing paper, practice breaking it down into simpler volumetric shapes. So an exercise that you can really easily do, especially if you're kind of struggling to see these 3D volumetric shapes in everyday objects, is to do some photo drawovers. You can do this by printing out your photos. You can do it directly on the photos. You can use tracing paper. You can even do it digitally, but it's just to help you get used to breaking down these more complex shapes into our 3D volumetric shapes that we've been practicing. So really, you're just training your eyes in a very safe and easy to do way. So I have some photos that I've gone ahead and printed out that I want to kind of trace over with you guys. And these are some household objects. Some of them are at different angles that I thought might be interesting or challenging. This is also a great way to, if you're working from your own reference, better understand the shapes that you're seeing. So let's say that you wanted to practice drawing a city skyline, which maybe we'll do that in a future video. That could be fun. This could be a great exercise for training your eyes to see those individual shapes out of a city skyline and to break it down into something that you can kind of change up and replicate as necessary. So I have a few different shapes here. Some of them are from the holidays. Some of them are camera mounts. It really could be whatever you feel like drawing or whatever shapes are interesting to you. We're really looking for a variety of complex shapes. So we're going to start here with my Junji Ito screaming cat. And I'm going to start by breaking this down kind of into simple sort of basic shapes. So we have a rectangle here. Actually, let me switch to something that is going to show up better on this paper. So we've got a rectangle here. And when we draw it over, it's definitely going to be a cylinder. But what we're seeing right here right now is basically a rectangular shape. So this is useful for when you're kind of blocking in your figures. We have a circle here and two triangles. Then we have this is going to be a cylinder later on, but it could be a rectangle for now. And then we have a triangular shape here. So that's a pretty simple, easy way to break it down into basic, regular 2D shapes that you're already super familiar with. So now that we've broken this down into simple 2D shapes, let's get a little bit more complicated and start breaking it down into our 3D volumetric shapes. So we have here a cylinder. We have here a sphere, and I'm going to do a hemisphere just to help us remember where the cat's looking. We actually have pyramids, which we haven't had a chance to talk about too much, mostly because I don't have any sample shapes in that form yet. We have a cylinder here, and then we have kind of an unusually shaped 
pyramid here. So this could either be kind of a conical shape or we could treat it like a four-sided pyramid. Now we've, we've progressed in this little drawing tutorial mini series. I'm gonna show you guys how to replicate these forms into their more complicated, more realistic versions. But what I challenge you guys to do is take some photos and practice doing some draw overs where we break it down into our simple 2D shapes and then into our slightly more complicated, more volumetric 3D shapes. And I'm gonna go through several of these in time-lapse just to help you guys practice. Now a tip for these sort of straight hard edged objects is basically when you're just getting started, when you're just kind of figuring it out, you can basically just practice by going over the outline since all of those angles are there. Now for this, I might want to break it down into squares first, but when you're doing the 3D volumetric drawovers, you can almost just trace this. Now that might seem like cheating, but what you're doing is you're working on that visual library. You're working on changing how you see the world around you and how you visualize these shapes and learn to recognize these shapes. So it's not really any more cheating than having a young child trace over letters to help them get used to writing letters and practicing letter forms. So for these keys up here, we could either break them down into cubes or we could break them down into two rectangular prisms. I'm just going to break them down into cubes since that's a little bit easier. And I apologize that on this one, which is such a good straight line, it would make such a good example, you guys can't actually see the lines that I'm drawing since it's so dark, but hopefully, Watching me go through the motions, you guys are kind of getting the gist of it. So a big part of my teaching philosophy is to give a lot of examples and to go over things a few times and try to come up with different ways of explaining it every time I go over it so that hopefully I can catch people in all their different learning styles. So we've got the visual going on, we've got the audio going on with me talking to you guys. At some point, I'd love to do a blog post about this. I'm working on a presentation for this and I am gonna teach this in person. So I'm trying to accommodate as many learning styles as possible with these kind of tutorials. So if I seem like I'm repeating myself, that might be, you might just be a very adept pupil in this particular topic and this might be something that's really helpful for somebody who's really struggling to understand what's going on. This sort of simple 2D blocking in that I'm doing is great for placement. This is particularly useful not when I'm just doing photo traceovers like this, but rather when I'm actually trying to draw what I see or I'm drawing something that has many elements in it and I wanna make sure I get the spacing just right. So when we do this still life, you guys will see me use this and hopefully it'll start to make sense why I'm doing both stages. This is kind of a sketching or a preliminary stage that's going to make refining it a lot easier because I figured out where everything is supposed to go earlier on. Something else I want you guys to notice, especially with this set of keycap selectors, is that we start out with a pretty front facing view and as it moves away from us, the camera as well as the viewer, our angles start to become a little bit more skewed. Our lines start to kind of shift in perspective and this can be a great exercise to practice when you're starting to get used to perspective and drawing in perspective and you wanna kind of practice that. Practicing with sort of simplistic 
easy to understand volumetric shapes like cubes and rectangular prisms can be a great way to start seeing the world in perspective and thinking about utilizing perspective and vanishing points as you draw. And I have a bunch of tutorials here on the channel where I talk about different types of perspective. I provide a lot of different drawing demonstrations and exercises that you guys can do along at home. So that combined with this will help you guys draw environments and characters within your environments better and more confidently. So hopefully you guys are starting to see that some objects that were otherwise once really complicated or seemed to be really complicated are really just made up of several very simple 3D volumetric shapes. And you can create a more dynamic image with how you start to rotate these in space, like foreshortening and perspective. So I've got a couple more drawovers that I wanna share with you guys, but hopefully you guys are starting to kind of get the gist that really, there are a few very, very complicated shapes out there, but most things we see in our day-to-day -day lives are really just made up of very simple 3D and 2D shapes kind of combined together to make a whole. My next few examples are kind of dark, so I'm going to use these more opaque acrylic markers just to help demonstrate it, but the principles remain the same. And hopefully, as you guys are watching me start a new image, you're already starting to notice the 2D and 3D volumetric shapes that go up to making the design of these objects. So this photo and the one we're going to do after that, this one, these are both great examples of foreshortening. So we've already drawn this tripod once going long ways. You guys kind of know what it looks like. This is with the bottom three feet really close to the viewer. So the, the view is very skewed. And then this is with the mount very close to the viewer so the view is very skewed. So you guys can really see how much larger these feet look compared to the top, even though we know they're really not that much larger 
Conversely, we can see how much larger the mount is compared to the feet in this shot. So foreshortening can be a really great way to draw visual interest, to imply that something's really important or to just create a more dynamic illustration. And it's much easier, in my opinion, to achieve foreshortening when you understand volumetric construction and you understand a little bit of perspective. So I'm gonna break down these two shots for you guys as well. So we've done several examples of these and the more you do, the better you're going to get, the easier it's going to be able to see the world around you volumetrically. So I would recommend doing a combination of these sort of photo traceover exercises, as well as practicing drawing everyday objects in real life and really focusing on that 3D volumetric drawing. So speaking of practicing that 3D volumetric drawing, we did do a couple of examples mainly based around the cylinder. For some reason, like as I'm looking around the room, that's most of what I can see. So I guess it's a pretty common form, but I do wanna practice doing a few more common household objects. Uh, just so that we can kind of practice breaking down these slightly more complex forms down into the simpler 3D volumetric shapes. So I'm going to go grab some things that aren't cylinders. I'll be right back. And then after we've done that, we can put it all together and start talking about drawing still life. So I have amassed a collection of household, at least to my household objects that I thought would be a little bit more complicated or a little bit more interesting to draw because they are either variations and tweaks on our 3D volumetric shapes or they're kind of more amorphous or they're a combination of several shapes together. And really, when I say this is how to draw everything, it really is how to draw everything. It does take some practice. It gets some getting used to. It's going to take some morphing and some shifting. But these basic shapes plus pyramids basically make up anything you're going to find. I mean, we do have like hexagonal solids and we also have toruses, some unusual shapes like that. But you could think of a torus as just a cylinder wrapped around itself to make a donut or a ring. As for the hexagonal solids, that's a little bit more complicated. But like I said earlier on, I basically think of it as a circle and just start shaving planes off as I go. I'm not trying for 100% perfection. And you can kind of get away with this a little bit more when you have a cartoonier art style and a little bit of deformation doesn't actually look out of place. The real key with that kind of thing is to make it look intentional. Make it a deliberate choice rather than something that you're weak at. And you guys can always look online and in real life for reference as well. So I'm gonna work my way through these everyday objects. I'm going to do exploded views to demonstrate the individual 3D volumetric shapes that make them up for the most part. And hopefully it'll start to click for you guys and you guys will start to really begin to develop an eye for seeing these volumetric shapes in our everyday life. And like I said, the more you practice doing this yourself, not just watching along, but actually practicing and doing exercises like this one, the easier it's going to be for you to be able to take what we've talked about today and actually draw the things you wanna draw from real life and from your imagination.
Now, one key tip to drawing these things somewhat realistically is to really try and keep in mind that all of these things have some kind of dimension and try to really think about what that dimension would be, where they kind of like where the back would be, where the sides would be, where the edges meet. Really think it through. And that's also why practicing drawing everyday objects from various angles will really help make this easier for you. Even if you're drawing complicated things like dinosaurs and whales and spaceships and stars. Not the stars are complicated, but even if you're drawing things mostly from your imagination or combining reality with imagination, practicing from everyday life Practicing from real life where you can physically hold and manipulate, turn around and examine the object, get really, really close to it, or pull it really far back. That's going to really help improve not only your drawing from life, but your drawing from imagination, your drawing from what you can conceive.
So for the rest of this class, we're going to be doing two different still lifes. We're going to start our still life with just these 3D volumetric forms and practice drawing these. And setting up a still life of these and practicing drawing different 3D forms in relation to one another can be really helpful and really useful for really getting this down pat. Then for our second still life, we're going to take some everyday household objects, arrange them in an interesting manner, and practice drawing that as well using what we talked about today to really make sure that we can capture the volume of the shapes and the objects that we're drawing. Now I tried to set up an interesting arrangement using the shapes that I have on hand, but I think if you have some larger versions of these, a mix of sizes would be really beneficial as well. And if you're struggling with this, I would recommend taking a photo of your still life and practicing doing a few draw overs just so that you kind of better understand the forms that we're dealing with today. So the first thing I'm going to do, and I'm actually going to keep it kind of at this angle so you can see me drawing and see what I'm drawing, although it is gonna kind of skew what I'm drawing, is I'm gonna try to capture all of my objects in relation to one another. So I'm going to kind of roughly sketch them in, mainly as 2D shapes. And I'm mostly just trying to think about placement. I'm gonna refine this a little bit later on as we progress. And when you're doing this exercise, feel free to utilize shading to kind of help you capture those forms, particularly our more rounded forms like this dice over here. Sorry about that. Didn't mean for it to go out of focus on you guys. So we're doing it really, really light and sketchy with the aim of refining it as we kind of go through and progress. So down here, we have our cone. I'm gonna draw the shape through as much as possible because we really wanna practice those 3D volumetric shapes. I'm gonna sketch it in red and then refine it in blue. Behind it, we have a cube and I'm even drawing through and past the cone. And this is where having multiple colored leads for the sketching phase can be really helpful. But you also wanna draw it really, really sketchy because you guys can see I'm actually making several passes at each, uh, each object. Then we have our cylinder. I'm also trying to pay attention to which planes of the objects I can see. Now my view is gonna be just a little bit different from yours, that's just how it works when we're recording, but there's a lot that's still the same and hopefully you guys are really getting the gist of it. Then we have our rectangular prism that has been propped up on the cube at hopefully kind of an interesting angle because I didn't wanna just have everything kind of just sitting on the desktop, very boring, very static. I wanted it to be a little bit more engaging. Then we have our little red sphere. Then touching our rectangular prism, we have another cube and this one has rounded edges because it's a large foam dice. And I'm also trying to pay attention to the sizes in relation to each other and that would be a lot more interesting if I had a variety of sizes. So I encourage you guys to go out if you're gonna do this exercise at home and find objects that are different sizes because studying those size relationships can be really important to capturing what you see. And then finally we have our triangular prism. So now I'm gonna start refining it. Do that in blue. And it's okay to take your time with this. Pay attention to the light source. You can actually do some really fun stuff if you have a strong light source and you can use that to study shading. And maybe we can spend another tutorial talking about lighting and shading as well because that's an area I'd really like to be stronger with. Now I do have a series on lighting and contrast for both alcohol markers and watercolor if you guys are interested in creating light and contrast with color. Okay, so there's our cylinder. 
Then we have our cube. And while these sort of studies might seem simplistic, they're a great way to really build up your skill set and become a stronger artist. Then we have our sphere. And we have some curve shading. Then we have our rectangular prism, which is at kind of an angle. Let me see if I can capture that a little bit better. And I'm gonna make sure that this side is in shadow. Then we have our larger curved cube. I think I didn't quite capture it. That's okay, because I didn't quite capture the angle we're actually looking at because I shifted a little bit as I was drawing. I'm also going to make sure I capture those dry erase dots that are on it. And then finally, we have our triangular prism. And really, when you shift where you're sitting, it really changes your still life. So that's a good reason also to kind of move around it and try drawing it from different angles. So that's the result of our 3D volumetric shape still life. I'm gonna set up a still life using real world objects and we'll draw that one together. So ideally when you're setting up a still life at home to practice from, you wanna have a variety of objects, not just different shapes, but different sizes, different materials. You want some that are more natural. You want some that are more synthetic. You wanna to try to capture as much as possible, but we're really just focusing on kind of the basics of volumetric drawing today. So while I do have a variety of objects, I'm not really so concerned about having a good mix of organic and inorganic objects or really different textures. We're mainly focusing on sizes and different shapes today. And again, I'm gonna attempt to capture drawing and talking to you guys, capturing both the drawing as well as the still life in case you wanna draw along with me. So again, it's first of all, I really try, need to try and find a fixed position so that I'm not moving and shifting my viewpoint, which is kind of hard because I literally have a road mic stand right in the middle of my, my drawing field of view. But if you're doing this at home, that hopefully won't be a problem. So. One of the things I like to do when I'm sketching a still life is I like to kind of capture the overall shape of it and then start breaking it down into smaller individual shapes. And another way I like to do this is just kind of sketching the sizes of the shapes. So super loose, I'm not really trying to capture anything. I'm more breaking down what I'm seeing into kind of individual blobs that I can then break down into volumetric shapes and kind of refine from there. So what I'm focusing on right now is general size, general placement, kind of general movement of the objects. So this would be that canister in the background, for example. I also like to make sure that I stack some of my objects. I have things on different levels but if you're doing this at home and it's too complicated for you and it starts to feel overwhelming, it's really best to start very simple and kind of work your way up. Maybe one, two, or three objects at a time. The goal isn't to beat you up or overwhelm you or make you feel like this is impossible while pretending like it's easy. The goal is to try and show you guys how easy it actually can be while empowering you to feel like this is something you can and even want to try tackling. So I've got kind of the basic shapes here. I would lift it, but it's gonna knock my things over. Now I'm gonna start refining my shapes and I'm doing big, loose, broad movements. I'm not putting any real pressure on what I'm drawing. Everything is kind of loose and kind of light and very, very sketchy. Because we can always tighten this up. 
I'm also paying attention to how objects relate to one another. If they're resting on another object, if one object is supporting another object, if something is leaning on something else, things like that. And in this still life, there's actually a lot of objects that are either standing on other objects or leaning on other objects. I'm also paying attention to placement. Where are things? How close are they to me, the viewer? How far away are they? That sort of thing. So even though we're not necessarily paying attention to color or to surface material, we still have a lot to kind of keep in mind and watch. And you can practice this even if you can't set up a still life, even if you're super busy, by just carrying around a small sketchbook with you and drawing the world around you. That's a practice I've sadly fallen out of as I've become increasingly reliant on social media. I tend to spend all my free time on my phone, but it's something I wanna work on improving and getting back to. I used to fill up dozens of mini sketchbooks with just sketches of whatever environment I happened to be in at the time. So even if you're super busy, that's a great way to, if you want to, utilize your time and improve your drawing skills. Now I am starting to pay some attention to the basic forms. So how spherical our little pig friend is with his little triangular ears, that sort of thing. But I'm still keeping things really, really loose and I'm gonna refine them a little bit later as I go. I'm mostly just kind of trying to refine everything at the same pace. Now see, I should have moved this whole cylinder over some because really it's too close to the rabbits. All of this I've compacted it too much trying to fit it onto my sketchbook. So one thing I like to do when I'm drawing and I'm drawing to learn is I like to kind of note where I've made my mistakes and rather than starting from scratch or erasing or really doing anything drastic, sometimes I'll just note the mistake to myself and decide to remedy it the next time and pay more attention to the spatial relationship. So my camera is actually in between my arm and the drawing pad. So I am having trouble with some extension. This is about as high as I can go. This cylinder should really be, I think, more pronounced. But hopefully you guys won't have those kind of limitations when you're drawing at home. So if you're newer here, I'm Becca. I have a master's degree in sequential art from SCAD and a BA in hypermedia, AKA digital art from UNO. And not only do I make comics, I make the comic seven inch Kara, but I've been teaching drawing comics and watercolor for about 10 years. So I'm coming at this thinking about it as a comic artist and what is useful to me as a comic artist. And although I have a boatload of art education under my belt, I was originally self-taught through the school of internet. So that's why it's really important to me to be able to provide very, very affordable, sometimes even free art classes for people. Because I grew up in rural Louisiana, where if you wanted to take art, you'd better test into talented art. And I did not test into talented art. So I really want to continue to be able to make art accessible to anybody who's interested in learning how to make art. So we've got our really rough sketch here. Now I'm going to work on refining my forms as I see them. And this is when I'm really going to start thinking about the dimensionality of the forms, like <laughs> the puffiness in the instance of the star or uh, the depth of the little cylinders that are the rings on this little sketchbook here, those sort of things. And some people grasp the concept of things having, even 2D things, having some depth quicker than others. It really took me a really long time. It wasn't until a, a long time of studying volumetric drawing. It wasn't really until the Glenville Pooh drawing manual that and reading Andrew Loomis's figure drawing for all it's worth, that things really started to click for me and I really started to make sh improvements in my art and really started to make progress. 
So if you have the time and the inclination, if you want to learn how to draw people, for sure, I would highly recommend both of those. I kind of worked through both of them at the same time because I found that the two of them together kind of filled in for the gaps that the other one left. And another thing I would do is I would basically take notes as I read in my sketchbook, copy all of the exercises, all the examples they had over and over and over again. And then I would practice what they talked about using figure drawing reference. And at the time on the internet, that was <laughs> pose maniacs. And that was about it. Uh, now there's loads of great figure drawing reference that you guys can easily and affordably find on the internet. So these are great times to be an artist who's trying to learn how to make art on their own. Lonely, but great times. And one thing that's really sad that I feel like social media and the needs of social media have kind of pushed me out of doing was practicing for the sake of practice, drawing things for the sake of practicing drawing and just keeping those skills up because drawing is a lot like working out. It's something you need to maintain if you want to keep that skill set at its, you know, best level. And even, <laughs> even drawing regularly. Like when I was younger, there, there used to be a saying that if you drew all the time, you know, you would naturally get better. I was somebody who drew every day for 10 years and I never made hardly any improvement at all because I didn't really know how to think about drawing or how to systematically and re how to systematically be able to recreate what I saw in my head on a sheet of paper with satisfactory results. And it really wasn't until volumetric drawing that I kind of started to learn how to develop a system of building my characters and building my environments. And these are, that's kind of the key that unlocked art for me and made it way more accessible. And it wasn't something I was taught in school, which is, you know, kind of a shame because to me, it's not necessarily the easiest method. I mean, just being able to draw and have some somewhat innate natural ability and eye for it would be the easiest way but hey we're not all born with that and I really like this method because it's a teachable skill and I'm all about teachable skills so I'm not necessarily aiming for perfection here with you guys today because a I'm talking and it's actually pretty difficult for me to be able to talk and draw and do both well at the same time. Although if I'm drawing from reference, it's a lot easier. I'm more focusing on demonstrating the techniques that I'm talking about and uh, hopefully you guys getting my point rather than me impressing you guys with like super amazing art. I do think that has a place, but I also think very accessible, like people seeing what you're doing and thinking I could do that too. I think that's also really important. So if I'm trying to impress you guys of anything, it is that volumetric drawing is a great tool. Even if you're already proficient at drawing, it can be a way to really level up your art. It can be a way if you're struggling to draw specific things like cars or Gundams or buildings, it can be a way of breaking down and understanding the world and making it into something that is easier for you to replicate on a 2D plane like this. And you know, if it doesn't work for you, that's fine. No shade. It is just one method of doing a thing. There are so many methods out there and I just wanted to introduce you guys to my favorite method, but there's a lot of different ways to approach art and to approach drawing. So maybe in later videos, we can talk about combining surface design and contour lines along with some shading to create depth of field. If you guys are interested in that, that's definitely something I'll consider. Um, and generally I do these drawing tutorials when I'm actually teaching a class on this topic. So if you live in Louisiana, I highly encourage you, if you like what you're hearing here, if it sounds friendly, if it sounds like, you know, something that you kind of resonate with and you want to take my classes, I teach with the public library. So I highly encourage you to come take my classes. And the more I'm paid to teach classes, the more I can afford to create these kind of tutorials because I use this as kind of class prep just to kind of help me prepare for the class to kind of work some of the kinks out to create some demos and to figure out how I want to present the material. 
So basically for me, when I'm teaching a new class or I'm teaching a class in a new way, or the class has either been, you know, lengthened or made shorter, then I enjoy kind of revisiting the material, reworking it, coming up with new demos. And uh, generally I'll record that because it kind of helps me work my way through the kinks. And I have done live streams, several live streams actually, where I do uh, teach. But while I enjoy those, I do find that I actually really enjoy these kind of class prep streams, partially because even though I'm not getting paid to create this video here, I am going to get paid to teach the class. So I'm very incentivized other than just taking pride in my work as an artist who wants to make art more accessible to more people. Um, you know, there is some payment involved, so it does help me pay my bills and it does help me continue to live my life. Uh, whereas live streams don't really do that, but I do enjoy live streams because I do enjoy answering people's questions and being able to help people directly, just like I enjoy teaching classes. So you guys can see, I'm just currently working my way through. Right now I'm actually working from left to right, which is unusual for me. Usually I work from right to left. Or I'm, I'm sorry, I got that reversed. I am working right to left today, when usually I work left to right as a right-handed person just to prevent smearing. Um, but because my camera cable is actually in the way and kind of impeding my drawing ability, I started on the easier side and working progressively harder. And something else, I'm not actually doing this, but I would encourage you guys to do it, and I'm not doing it because I'm recording, is I would recommend you tilt. Either you stand up so that you get a flat view, because this is going to be skewed. When I lift this up, I'm looking at it from an angle. This is actually going to be skewed. And usually what I like to do is I like to block everything when I'm looking at it straight on and have my sketchbook propped up a little bit, and I can like compare the still life against what I'm drawing, and that's going to help prevent the illustration from being too skewed but the necessities of recording today kind of limits my ability to do that you know because I can't like stand up and get a good view top-down view and also see the still life from a good top-down view but if I were doing this to practice or if I were doing this in the classroom then I would definitely be much more careful about making sure that what I'm drawing isn't a skewed version of what I'm seeing but since this is just a demonstration and I'm sketching, I'm not super, super concerned about that, but I am pointing it out to you guys because if this were a more serious illustration, that can be really disheartening when you've spent all this time drawing. So this should be further over too, but that's okay. When you spend all this time drawing something and you realize it's gotten really skewed compared to what you're trying to draw or what you thought you were drawing. So I'm going to use the blue pencil and I'm just going to go in and tighten it just a little bit. I don't really need to, but it'll make it a little bit easier to see, I think. This is particularly useful when you're first really getting used to doing volumetric drawing. In case you have all these guidelines that you've drawn, having a secondary color kind of helps make your finished art pop out to you a little bit more. Because what's really important isn't really us showing off our sketchbooks on YouTube and on, on TikTok. What's really important is us learning from our sketchbooks and being able to read our sketches and being able to utilize what we've learned in future drawings that we're more serious about. And I'm not trying, I'm not trying to dunk on sketchbook artists. I just, because I teach 12 to 14 year olds pretty commonly, that's actually something that comes up a lot in this need to have a quote unquote perfect sketchbook, which I actually think the idea of a perfect sketchbook is kind of a toxic idea because the whole point of a sketchbook is it's our place to make mistakes. It's our place to learn. It's like a lab. It's our place to learn and make mistakes and experiment and kind of figure out what we want our art to be so that later on, on the nicer paper, we can turn around and make those pieces that we're really going to be proud of. And it's cool if sometimes you something in a sketchbook turns out really great. And it's cool if sometimes in a sketchbook, what you did turns into total garbage. Like both, as long as you're drawing, as long as you're growing, as long as you're learning, both are important, both are good. So I, I just want to push back a little bit on the idea that a sketchbook needs to be this perfect object of art in and of itself that you're showing off because I feel like that could really kind of hinder growth. I mean, if you want to have a separate sketchbook, like a mixed media book 
for those more finessed drawings, that's fine. I feel like we kind of need to come up with a different name for that though. I'm getting sloppy on that star. I'm not paying enough attention to the contour lines on the star. I've already done the star like three times, so. That's not a good excuse. I'm just, just explaining. And I think I mentioned this earlier, but I, for my sketchbook, sketchbooks where I do my thinking and I do my pre-planning, I work with really cheap sketchbooks. Um, not the cheapest sketchbooks. I do like some tooth to the paper, but I like to use, my preference are the Blick Studio sketchbooks. Those are great. Uh, but, you know, I can't get those here in Louisiana other than ordering them. So when I forget to order them, uh, I generally am using a Strathmore 300 series sketchbook. So the yellow cover one, you can get them at a lot of places. Not at Walmart, though. But you can't get them at Michael's. So that's what I, I use. And one of the great things about that is if I fill this sketchbook with failed sketches, failed thumbnails, stuff I never use, stuff I don't like. I don't care like that's great like it's finished it's a filled sketchbook check plus a plus you did it um whereas if i was working with nicer sketchbooks i would actually feel weird and guilty about these kind of sketches and these kind of studies i would feel like it was a waste of paper because it's so much more expensive so i also really recommend you work with something the cheapest thing you are comfortable with and happy with drawing on if you like to draw on printer paper Get a ream of printer paper. Fill up that ream of printer paper. If you want to draw on loose leaf paper, because that's what you're comfortable with, go with that. Don't worry so much about getting, like, you know, a Canson XL mixed media sketchbook, which is not the most expensive, um, and, it, and filling it with perfect things. We're here to learn, and we're here to study, and we're here to improve and grow. And that means taking risks, making mistakes, making ugly art, Making ugly drawings. Sometimes. Because that's a great opportunity to, to grow. You can grow and develop as an artist making just beautiful art. I'm, I'm sure you can once you hit a certain level. As long as you're trying new things. Because, you know, you hit a point where you're good enough with the material. Where even if you're experimenting and you make something look terrible. You kind of know how to fix it and turn it into something good. Or recycle it or repurpose it into something good, but it takes a while to get to that point. So the next time we hang out and we talk about volumetric drawing, I'm hoping we can talk about some really complex shapes. I'm actually going to borrow some of my brother's Gundams because those are a great example of, you know, very simple volumetric shapes that combine to make a really complex shape. And it's also in a way a good introduction to drawing the human form. Which is not the end-all, be-all, only reason you should learn volumetric drawing. But volumetric drawing is a great tool for figure drawing and for drawing people and for drawing faces and for drawing animals. Hell, speaking of, I've got tutorials on all those things and more here on the channel if you want to skip ahead. But next time we hang out, we're going to talk about drawing more complex shapes. So I've given you guys a bunch of exercises that you can practice that will help build confidence and help build this skill set. We've talked about getting a set of inexpensive 3D volumetric shapes. I mean, you can even go to Michael's and buy some of the styrofoam ones. They're really not expensive. And practicing drawing those until you're comfortable enough to be able to generate them from memory in any view that you want to be able to draw them in. We talked about filling sketchbook pages of those volumetric shapes from different angles to just build up that skill set and build up that confidence. We talked about breaking down household objects into those 3D volumetric shapes, kind of how to go about thinking about it, how to do that, and practicing from there and drawing those from different angles. We talked about taking photographs and drawing over those photographs. And really, I would recommend using tracing paper for that. I'm out of tracing paper. That's the only reason I didn't do it. And using that to kind of study how these forms are put together. We talked about setting up a still life from the basic 3D volumetric shapes and practicing drawing that. 
so that we're practicing drawing multiple objects kind of interacting with one another. And then we talked about setting up a still life, again, using household objects. We also talked about keeping a sketchbook and what kind of stuff can go in your sketchbook that will help you become a better artist. And we even talked about a really simple exercise where you just bring a mini sketchbook around and you fill it with sketches and doodles of the surroundings in your environment. What what is actually around you? Now you don't have to you don't have to do a mini sketchbook of that. You could just do it if you're a student on loose leaf paper every new classroom you sit in. If you have time and your teacher doesn't mind, kind of doodle your surroundings while you're not otherwise occupied. That could be a great way to kind of practice these skills. But that's what it's going to come down to. These are skills. These are things that you can improve, you can grow, you can hone, you can develop. Your eye and how you perceive the world is also a skill that you can kind of hone and develop through practice and careful observation as well. So the more you practice, the more confident you're going to be and the better it's going to turn out and the easier and the quicker it's going to come to you. When you're first starting this, it can be really, really slow and tedious because you're kind of training your brain and your eye to think and interpret in a way you're not really used to. And that can take a long time to get used to. It's like learning to ride a bike. You're training all these new muscles. You're training all these new reflexes. Same thing with drawing. It's a learnable, trainable skill. Now, how to create great art, that's different. You're developing your taste, and I would recommend that you consume a lot of art and you read a lot of comics. I don't think you can be a good comic artist if you don't read comics. There might be a few exceptions, but generally, the best way to become a good comic artist and to improve your comic storytelling is to read comics. And really, a wide variety of comics will give you a wider range to draw from, both in how they tell the story and how they choose to illustrate certain things, as well as just the art style itself. So even though I'm not the best at drawing, I won't pretend that I am, I'm often slower than my peers and my friends, and I think I have more failures and misses than other artists I know, I still love drawing. I still get a lot of enjoyment out of it. Even just doing these sort of studies, I really enjoy doing these. And I think cultivating a love of just the act of drawing and, and practicing and training those muscles and developing that fine motor coordination, I think that's really important as well. And working on loving the process of drawing is going to make it a lot easier to sink the time you might need to sink into learning how to draw, especially if you're not a natural artist. And I'm not really a natural or I don't consider myself a natural artist. Maybe the fact that I am tenacious and willing to stick with it and have found methods that work for me when I had teachers and friends who were not necessarily so willing to help, maybe that kind of is what my little special skill set is to help me out, you know, being tenacious when you're an artist, especially if you're not a very good artist to begin with, or not an artist that has taste and a skill set that is what's currently popular, you really have to be tenacious, tenacious and want to stick it out. Or teaching art, teaching art and being good at art are two very different things. And I think I'm half decent at teaching art because I was so bad at art for so long and I had to really learn how to do things and be analytical about it. It didn't come easy for me. So I've got everything blocked in. I could go in and add some of the surface details. That's really gonna give a good indication of you know the relationship with the viewer and what planes these details are on. It's also going to kind of fill out the illustration so it doesn't look so much like those base 3D volumetric sh shapes we've been practicing. It's going to look more like, you know, a canister with rabbits and cats and other things on it, that sort of thing. But for today's purposes, I think this still life is good enough. We just spent 30 minutes talking about it and I don't want to drag this on forever because I know you guys want to get drawn.
Today I had the absolute pleasure of sharing my keys to drawing anything you want to be able to draw. It takes practice, it takes determination, it takes a keen eye, and it takes a lot of study. But I firmly believe that if you can see and if you can hold a pencil, you can learn how to draw volumetrically. We started with some really basic basics learning how to draw some pretty common 3D volumetric shapes using these little foam demonstrators as our reference. We talked about a variety of exercises that are fairly simple to do that you guys can do at home that'll help you hone these skills so that you can draw what you want to learn how to draw. We then talked about how to break down and understand common household objects into these common volumetric shapes so you guys can start developing your eye and learning how to see those shapes in your everyday life. We did a bunch of photo draw overs where I took various photos and walked you guys through how to break them down into these volumetric shapes so you can practice training your eye and seeing those shapes in everyday life. We then started drawing some slightly more complicated household objects and I demonstrated how to break those down into common shapes or how to learn how to see those common shapes within those household objects. And we did a bunch of them and I shared some tips and tricks with you guys along the way. We then set up a still life using our volumetric objects so we could start practicing drawing the relationships and drawing multiple objects within a scene. And then finally, we set up a small household still life using objects that I just happen to have lying around the house, which I'm sure you guys can create your own still life very similar to this one here. And I kind of not only walked you guys through how to break this thing down, how to work on it systematically and set it up and determine the relationships between the different objects, but we also talked about my background and a lot of my philosophy on how to be successful at learning how to draw. So I am so, so glad that you've invited me into your life to help you make art a habit. And hopefully I've shared some tips, some tricks, and a tutorial that will make that just a little bit easier for you guys. I've got loads of really great, helpful drawing tutorials. I'm gonna link them down in the description below. So I really hope you guys will check them out. This was recorded to help me prepare for the first class on my three class series on volumetric drawing. If you wanna see more drawing tutorials from me, a great way to do that is to actually attend my classes if you happen to live in Louisiana. And if you don't, to spread the word and let more people know about the work that I'm doing, not only here, but also with the public library. I'm really passionate about making art accessible to a wider variety of people, whether you're a young artist or an older artist, whether you're new at art or you're just looking at looking for a new way to see the world. Hopefully I can help you guys find a way to do that and make it fun and accessible at the same time. So thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, please remember, leave me a big old thumbs up. Leave me a comment, something that you liked about this tutorial perhaps, or maybe some questions you might have that I could answer in an upcoming tutorial, or even requests for tutorials that you'd like to see here on the channel. If you're new here, please consider hitting that subscribe button because I've got a lot of really great stuff to share with you guys and I've got plans for even more. And consider hitting that bell notification and letting YouTube know that you wanna hear when I share new stuff. So I hope you guys have a wonderful day. I'm looking forward to sharing part two with you guys in the near future and hopefully I'll see you guys again soon. So have a wonderful day guys, bye.